Minister Vista, thank you so much for taking the time to visit the Fletcher School. I'd like to use our time together to discuss some of the really momentous changes in Finland's foreign policy and security policy over the last two years. Can you start by describing what has changed in Finland's thinking about European security? Well, thanks for, first for the opportunity of being here. This is at most interesting to meet with you, but also the experts here in Fletcher School and, and discuss with people on the, all security aspects, including, of course, what's happening in Europe and, and on our border between Finland and Russia. But uh, if you look at our security thinking and how it has been developing, uh, Finland, of course, has been a partner for NATO for, for a long time already. Uh, and actually, we had had in our uh, security white paper since 2004, if I'm not mistaken, so-called NATO option. We are the only country that has had a NATO option, but it has uh, been formulated in a way that uh, we are staying outside of NATO, but if something changes in our security environment, we are ready to apply NATO membership. So that was a conditional uh, issue and, and people were quite pleased uh, in the current arrangements that we have a partnership and cooperation with NATO, also cooperation with our neighborhood, uh, with Sweden, with Norway. Uh, but since the 24th of uh, February last year, when Russia attacked Ukraine, it was an immediate change in the public opinion and also the op opinion of the politicians that we, we were thinking that if uh, Russia can break the international rules, uh, UN rules, or OSC rules, in such a blatant way. Uh, it's better to seek for additional security also for Finland. And we were also thinking it's not so good to do it alone, that we need Sweden on board. And we used last spring not only to prepare our own application for NATO, but also to convince Sweden that now it's time to join together. And when you look at NATO's response and also Europe's response to the war, how would you assess the major successes of that response? And what do you see as the shortcomings of the response so far? Well, of course, the uh, paradox is that when I'm sitting in the EU ministerial meetings with 27 EU countries, we speak about the lethal aid to Ukraine. When I'm sitting in the NATO uh, ministerial uh, setting, we speak about the non-lethal aid to Ukraine. And that, of course, reminds us that NATO is to protect its own member states. And that's the main goal for NATO. And that's, of course, why also Finland and Sweden were seeking for the membership. But when we speak about the European Union and European Union, of course, together with the US, together with UK and other like-minded countries, we have been uh, channeling huge amount of lethal aid to Ukraine, including Finland. We have been se sending now 15 military packages to Ukraine, uh, worth of more than one, uh, one billion uh, euros. And this is actually the first time after the Second World War that we are sending weapons to, to some uh, conflict area. And, and that was, of course, decided based on the needs of Ukraine, based on the need to, to support Ukraine against this violation of Russia. Finland has long had a complex relationship with Russia, but also a deep relationship in many ways dictated by geography. How have Finland's views of Russia changed in the last two years? Well, of course, we have a long border, a long land border with Russia, 800 miles. Uh, and and uh, when we first look about our defense arrangements, of course, since Second World War, we have had a, a obligatory uh, military service. We have uh, around 300,000 men and women in our wartime reserve. And uh, we have been taking care of our own defense for years. For example, already before the Ukraine war, we have ordered uh, 64 F-35 fighters from US and so forth. So we, we have been renewing also our military capabilities all the time. Actually, the Ukrainian ambassador in Helsinki asked me one time that, how can you negotiate with somebody to whom you have zero trust? And I said, well, uh, it's difficult, but if I'm thinking uh, our history after the Second World War, we negotiated with Russia after the war, uh, we had a peace agreement, but at the same time, people were hiding arms. 
And why they were hiding arms? Of course, they were hiding arms because they didn't trust that the violence is over and, and that uh, they were thinking that Russia could still come over the border. And only uh, in time, the confidence was built uh, after the war. And um, uh, I, I think that confidence, of course, maintained. It was uh, throughout the Cold War period. And then, of course, 1975, when the, the OSC was formed, uh, the Helsinki summit was kept and so forth. It was a new uh, end of the Cold War period and, and some some kind of added in increased cooperation also with the Eastern Bloc. But I think uh, that cooperation also uh, included the seeds for new type of civilian movements, uh, movements in, in the Eastern Bloc or behind the Iron Curtain who, who wanted more freedoms, more democratic rights and so forth. And, and that we could actually see when the Berlin Wall collapsed. And when you look at the current war, which is different in many ways from the Cold War you were referencing, but has the same block tensions and conflict, and think about the future. No one knows how the war is going to end, but at some point there will need to be a reckoning with what role does Russia play, if any. How do you think about the longer term, over five or 10 or 20 years? Well, I will pursue you the same question, but, uh, <laughs> but if I'm f first saying, how do I see it? Well, we can end up to many kinds of scenarios. One scenario is, is some kind of ceasefire scenario. One scenario is a frozen conflict scenario. One scenario, of course, it, is that we will see some post-Putin forces in, in Russia that somehow internally Russia will uh, change. Uh, but I think in all these scenarios, to strengthen the defense of Ukraine is very important. I know that uh, one of the topics in the coming Vilnius summit, NATO summit in uh, July will be, of course, the, the added support to uh, Ukraine and what kind of relationship NATO and Ukraine will have. But I think in all scenarios, we need to build the defense of uh, Ukraine stronger to resist, of course, any uh, new reactions from Russia, any, any new hostile reactions from Russia against uh, Ukraine. And I guess that could be one lesson from Finland's own history, a country that fought a war with Russia, the Soviet Union, and then had to live next to Russia for decades after that. Are, are there other lessons from Finland's experience that are relevant to Ukraine? Well, of course, when talking to uh, Ukrainians, they refer very often to our winter war. They refer very often to our leader, uh, Marshal Mannerheim. Of course, we have to remind that after the war comes the peace. We also made a peace uh, uh, agreement. It was very difficult. It's not easy, as we always, always know. One issue that, of course, uh, have been surprising many our Western European partners is that we ta have been taking care of the civilian defense and, and civilian protection after the Second World War. We are one of the countries that will systematically still build bomb shelters in cities and so forth. And now actually some of our European allies are coming to Helsinki to look, oh, you have a bomb shelter here <laughs> and you are building new bomb shelters. Why? Well, we, we, said we get used to that and, and we, we, we are looking all kinds of uh, negative scenarios. And I think we, we, we are peace loving people. We want to live in peace, but of course, uh, based on the history also, we are always preparing for the worst. When you look at the European response overall, there's been obviously the NATO um, response that you've discussed also at the European level. You mentioned um, Europe's lethal aid to Ukraine. Uh, right now within the European Union, there's a debate about strategic autonomy as one framework for European foreign policy. There's um, pros and cons of that approach that are advocated by different member states. How do you see the European debate about Europe's foreign policy as having been impacted by the war? Well, first of all, I, I have to say that I'm very proud to be European at this moment when I've seen the uh, unity of uh, European Union in responding to the Russian aggression. Actually, first, uh, we have been uh, taking refugees from Ukraine, uh, big amounts, we have been supporting Ukraine, uh, uh, of course, humanitar through humanitarian aid. Uh, we have been already uh, supporting with the reconstruction of the country, and we are supporting with the lethal aid to, to uh, Ukrainian military. So I think this has been very comprehensive aid packages, and, and European Union has been very united on those issues. 
when looking uh, towards the future and, and lessons learned and, and about the strategic autonomy thinking, for example, I think both, of course, the war, Russian aggression against Ukraine, but even previously the COVID-19 period triggered a lot of this kind of debate about the strategic autonomy. Are we too dependent on China, for example, with the medicines or protective equipment and so forth uh, during the COVID time? And it's interesting that when strategic autonomy has been historically used actually as describing the US-Europe relations. Now we speak with the same words about the China-Europe uh, uh, or our earlier dependency on, on uh, Russian oil and gas and, 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 and so forth. So I think we have learned a big lesson here. And there I would make a big differentiation between our relationship between, let's say, China, Europe, where we have to maybe cut some of those dependencies on critical issues that we have had on, on China. And then on the other hand, of course, uh, we have to manage uh, also uh, our future with our own forces, vis-a-vis -vis United States, but of course the historic connections and tr transatlantic connections are, are valuable for Europe. And we have seen, for example, in the case of uh, Ukraine, that without the support of uh, US, uh, Ukraine could not have been uh, resisting what, what, what's happening. So we needed both uh, US support and European support. We've heard a lot over the past 15 months about Europe uh, putting more money into its defense budgets, Germany most um, prominently, but other countries as well. Do you see this as being a turning point in European defense efforts, or do you worry that some of the pronouncements made last year might actually be difficult to implement in certain countries? Well, of course, there are differences. And, and when, when we agree of the 2% of the GDP, we hear some countries facing difficulties, not only in Europe. I, I was listening to Canadian prime minister on this topic, so it's a, it's a challenge in many uh, many ways, but I'm, I'm I'm thinking that countries have learned their lesson on the defense budgets. But then, of course, what concerns me is very much the whole uh, situation with the multilateralism in these circumstances, because we have a UN where uh, Security Council is is paralyzed uh, due to the action of Russia and action of China preventing relevant decisions in the Security Council. Uh, the moral authority has now been taken by the General Assembly, more than 140 votes against uh, Russian aggression and so forth. Uh, but of course, we see a United Nations that cannot act at this moment. And we see also some uh, countries sitting on the fence, so to say, and, and some countries, of course, uh, voting in favor of uh, Russia. In, in European context, we have the OSCE organization established 1975 in Helsinki. Actually, 2025, Finland will be a chair again. And we are looking, we, we were thinking that we should somehow renew the spirit of Helsinki. We were thinking that earlier. But now when we have a war in Europe, unfortunately, we have a situation that the multilateral force that we have in Europe is not functional. And it's a pity because this OSCE was very often referred to in other continents and said that they would like to achieve what we have achieved in Europe. And, and unfortunately, it's in ruins at the moment. Well, you mentioned some of the countries that are fence-sitting. Uh, China might be one example of a fence-sitter. On the one hand, being rhetorically supportive of Russia in certain ways, on the other hand, not actively supplying lethal aid. How do you assess China's role in the conflict thus far? I think it's very interesting, of course, where China stays. I think China has definitely common interest with Russia, for example, this uh, uh, wish to live in a multipolar world, not, not dominated by US or, or Western countries and so forth. So there, definitely China uh, has an interest to, to support Russia and, and uh, uh, Russia's role and, and their own role in the, in the world. But uh, I would also say that uh, China has difficulties with, uh, uh, with issues of uh, uh, protecting sovereignty and protecting existing borders and so forth, which has been violated in, in Ukraine because they, they might think they're also their own country and, and, and the future and the international principles there. And I have noticed that when the Chinese peace proposal, or peace proposal, however you want to call it, uh, came out, uh, it was criticized in the West, 
but actually the Ukrainian reaction was quite interesting because the, it was almost let's talk and let's get engaged with China and let's look what is in it. And actually, since President Zelensky has his, his all, own 10 point peace plan, the question to China is that, hey, why don't you join our peace plan? What is the difference between your peace plan and our peace plan? And I think it's a good strategy to, to keep China on and, and China busy also with, uh, with uh, helping the peaceful solution in this case. Whether, whether it will maintain like that, uh, difficult to say, but I think it's a good try. One of the challenges in uh, Western relations with China during the war has been the question of economic sanctions, uh, with China not joining the sanctions, but certain Chinese companies following certain sanctions, but not others. How do you assess the success or the efficacy of Western sanctions so far? Well, of course, now when we have just seen actually in, in TV, the in direct sending uh, uh, where the uh, Russian Minister of Finance is, is warning President Putin that this is not going well. Uh, it of course reflects to the fact that the sanctions are influencing to uh, Russian economy. But what we are quite concerned after the 10 sanction packages of European Union and the 11th on preparation is that the circumvention of the sanctions is so easy or, or that we have seen uh, alternative routes for money and, and uh, goods and so forth reaching uh, Russia and, and we really have to block those routes and we have to be effective on the circumvention and also, of course, harmonizing the sanctions uh, you know, in a transatlantic way and, and having UK on board and, and probably other G7 countries on board. And I, I think the G7 also plays an important role in this. And presumably that also involves putting pressure on countries that have become uh, routes for sanctions diversion, whether that's Turkey or countries in Central Asia. What are the tools that uh, Europe or the G7 have to uh, try to stop this type of diversion? Well, I think there is on, on sanction issue, there is certainly the, the influence that can be used to these countries and, and just, you know, pinpointing and, and saying it openly that one of the routes is here and so forth is, is adding the pressure. And this is what we are doing both, uh, both openly and, and, and silently with some of these countries. And of course, you at the same time have to uh, try to influence those countries that uh, are still sitting on the fence and, and uh, not doing how to vote, not knowing how to vote on, on these big uh, votings in the UN and so forth. And I, I think this engagement with uh, Latin America, with African countries, with certain uh, Asian countries at this moment is very, very important. And at least from the Finnish side, also we have done the diplomacy, you know, visiting Senegal, visiting Kenya, visiting Somalia. Our president went to South Africa, to Namibia to explain how does it look from our point of view, what, what Russia is doing and what are our expectations to our partners also in the global south. Well, you mentioned the votes at the UN condemning uh, Russia's invasion. On the other hand, though, there have been a lot of countries that have equivocated, as you've alluded to. How do you explain the, that, that in the West, in, in Europe and a small number of Asian allies, there's a real focus on Russia as the aggressor, but in a lot of the global south, there's a much less willingness to condemn Russia in a sense that the war doesn't have as clear of a moral valence, a good side and a bad side as many leaders in the West think. Of course, there's in many countries uh, dependencies on Russia, on China and so forth, and these dependencies might might uh, affect also to the voting. We had an excellent uh, meeting, Nordic uh, Africa ministerial meeting last summer in Helsinki, and uh, it was interesting. We had 20 uh, African foreign ministers uh, and, and the five Nordic ministers together. And these were our traditional partners in, in Africa on, on development and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember very clearly the moment when, when we expressed to the South African minister that, hey, we were two we Nordic countries against the apartheid. We, we, f we were fighting with you. We were fighting with you against the colonialism in Africa. How come you don't at this moment recognize that the Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine is new type of imperialism and violating the very principles that we all share in the UN context. And actually it was an extremely open, extremely blunt mm. discussion. And, and uh, uh, I, I think we need that kind of debate more. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting to put that discussion next to an alternative discussion that's present in the global, global South, arguing that actually the West is 
is this hegemonic, in some cases even imperialistic power that is uh, the one that needs to be pushed back against. It's, it's fascinating to watch that debate play out in the General Assembly, for example. And actually, one issue I was I was um, uh, in in the uh, uh, one of those conferences in in uh, Arab countries where we discussed about the the issue that is this now only a Western or European interest that is on stake at this moment. And I said, hey, when Iraq occupied Kuwait 1990. Immediately after the occupation, a Kuwaiti delegation came to Helsinki and met us in the parliament and told us that our country has been against the UN charter occupied by our neighbor and we need help based on the Article 51. And then a coalition of the willing was formed to help Kuwait, help the uh, Iraqi invasion out from the country. So. We didn't react only on European issues. We have been reacting also to something that is happening in, in Arab countries and others. And I, I, could, I could see that that argument mm. was, was taken and understood quite well. Turning back to, to Russia, one of the striking things about the, the war thus far in Russia has been that at least a big chunk of the population in Russia has been actively supportive. It's hard to know because of the repression domestically, but certainly a lot of people have been taken up by nationalism, believe that Ukraine doesn't have sovereignty. What hope do you have that over the coming years that view in Russia can be changed? Or are we setting ourselves up for what's likely to be a longer term period of antagonism or confrontation with Russia that is going to be difficult to unwind because the Russian populace thinks the war is a good idea? Well, of course, we have particularly among the diaspora who has left Russia strong opinions on, 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 on this issue. I met with Kari Gasparov and, and so forth, who, has, who are extremely critical to the current leadership in Russia. But I think the most, uh, uh, the biggest optimism ra ra is raised when, when you see people in the, inside the country uh, expressing their opinions. And, and uh, I have been following uh, the singer Alla Pugacheva or, or the rock uh, and DDT and Yuri Chevchuk and so forth, who are openly inside the country, actually criticizing what is going on. And, uh, and but definitely, you you are right that the uh, general feeling is that uh, there is a patriotic feeling, a nationalistic feeling, what's going on. And of course, I, I remember actually very well when the Baltic countries got their independence or took their independence back and, and so forth. And and then uh, some of my I would say liberal friends in St. Petersburg said that, okay, yes, the Baltic states, they were never actually part of Russia really, but Crimea, Crimea has always been ours and a lot of emotional feelings uh, around the Crimea, the history of Crimea are there and uh, it's probably easy to raise these nationalistic feelings, feelings at this moment. Well, I think one of the striking takeaways is the, the continued relevance of nationalism in an era when many people thought that transnational or liberal ideas were becoming to play a larger role in politics, the war has actually illustrated that that's not always the case. Well, I, I, I think, unfortunately, the same waves we see also in, in uh, Western hemisphere and, and in Western Europe, even US and so forth, where these kind of nationalistic or, or patriarch, ultra-patriarchic tendencies are also used, sometimes populistic tendencies are used, you know, to raise, I would say, a wrong type of nationalism and, and so forth. And, and this is the very same phenomena that we are following in, in, in Russia. I don't see any difference. Wait, and Finland might be an example of the right type of nationalism, uh, patriotism, willingness to defend one's country. C can you talk about how Finland has maintained its really extraordinary cohesion uh, in spite of a very difficult geopolitical environment? Well, Finns are very security oriented people and I, I can notice them at the same time uh, staying very calm and, you know, not exaggerating issues, not not doing things out of hatred or anything like that. I think the ordinary Finns are thinking that uh, Russians are human beings like us. Uh, there's not so big difference, but their leadership are making big mistakes. So we don't hate the ordinary people. We accept, accept that they, they, they are not the decision makers at this stage, but, but the leadership has made the very dramatic wrong decisions with Ukraine and, and we have to resist that. And, and then this kind of feeling that, you know, we will in all circumstances take care of our own security, in all circumstances. So when we joined NATO, now there's a question, will you have NATO troops in Finland or NATO bases in Finland? We say, no, we are first line is all our own defense. And then if you need help, 
then NATO is there to help. And that's our attitude. And when you look at Russia's response to your joining of NATO, on the one hand, Russia has been very critical of many other countries joining NATO over the past 30 years. On the other hand, it seemed to me that Russia's response when you finally joined was pretty minimal. Well, yes, it, I think the immediate reaction was minimal. Of course, we had all kinds of uh, negative scenarios when we decided to, to apply NATO membership. And we had to count also what will happen, you know, if there is any harassment, our airspace, our maritime areas, or even our land areas, uh, hybrid threats and, and so forth, cyber threats. We had to be, we had to calculate all kinds of possibilities. But that's true that, that uh, there was not uh, any race of uh, incidents or, or so forth. But of course, uh, the relationship is not good. We have still our diplomatic representatives in, in uh, uh, Moscow and in St. Petersburg. Uh, Russia has the, the embassy in, in Helsinki and so forth. And of course, uh, we don't actually communicate now on a higher political level, not on the presidential level, not on the foreign minister or prime minister level. But some of our staff, of course, is communicating with Russia on the border, uh, guarding the border and, and so forth. We, we want to keep the border peaceful and uh, and border is still open, by the way, to people who work in Finland, who have the work permit, people from Russia who study in Finland, relatives who visit each other and so forth. So the border is not closed. Well, one of the interesting facets of Russia's rhetoric about the war is that if you listen to Russian political leaders or watch state TV, you'll hear that Russia's at war with NATO. That's how Russia's describing. But when you look at actually the actions Russia's taken over the past 15 months, it's been solely focused in Ukraine. Despite predictions of cyber attacks or hybrid activities, there hasn't been a lot of that. Yes. Uh, how do you explain well, I, uh, my feeling is that that's, of course, the strength of the NATO, that also Russia knows that if if they move to that direction, that they take NATO or any NATO country as an enemy, the whole NATO will respond. And and, and, and that is, of course, a totally another scale of, of response what's, what's, what's coming now. So we have chosen the strategy also to, to try to keep the borders uh, peaceful, but at the same time support Ukraine as much as we can. Minister, thank you so much for taking the time for this conversation. It's a delight to host you at the Fletcher School. Thank you. It's my pleasure and welcome to Helsinki.